on global business. China's financial regulators and policy-making bodies hold talks with private enterprises to see what the financial sector can do to support the country's private economy. Global engagement. Britain's top diplomat James Cleverly visits China today. This is the first trip by a UK foreign secretary to China in over five years. U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Rimoto is in Shanghai as she looks to wrap up her visit aimed at boosting trade and cultural exchange. Good evening from the CTTN headquarters in Beijing and this is Global Business. I'm Lily Lu. The People's Bank of China held a meeting to assess the financial support required for the development of private enterprises on Wednesday. Ma Jianyang, Deputy Director of the Financial Market Department of the PBOC, said the central bank is formulating measures to support growth of the private economy. At the same time, a total of 18 private enterprises signed contracts with financial institutions, stock exchanges and the interbank market dealer associations to increase financial support for small and medium-sized enterprises. Take a listen. We'll carefully listen to the opinions, suggestions, financial institutions and private enterprises and systematically summarize typical experiences, practices, existing problems and suggestions various financial institutions in various regions, focusing on pain points and difficulties in the service process of private enterprises. Efforts will be made to enhance the sense of access and satisfaction of financial services for private enterprises. In recent years, the government has provided strong support for the promotion and development of private enterprises, especially for science and technology innovation enterprises like us. It's mainly reflected in funding. Bank lending is no longer limited to our business skill and revenue, but also comprehensively evaluates the technical characteristics, development stage, and future market space of our industry and enterprises. In the future, the assistance provided by financial institutions will also penetrate into aspects such as business and enterprise development. One of China's four largest banks, the Bank of China, says it will continue to boost the building of a modern industrial system, support a private sector and promote high-level opening up. And that is according to the bank's interim results press conference held in Beijing on Wednesday. The bank's total assets stood at more than 31 trillion yuan or over 4 trillion U.S. dollars as of the end of June. That is up more than 7 percent compared to the end of last year. The bank also reports increased credit for strategic emerging industries and manufacturing. Supporting the building of a modern industrial system, boosting inclusive finance as well as rural revitalization were all high on the bank's agenda. Officials also also emphasized the importance of supporting the Belt and Road Initiative, the internationalization of the renminbi, as well as international trade and economic cooperation. We will deeply cultivate overseas markets, seize strategic opportunities such as ORCEP, the Belt and Road Initiative, the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area, as well as the Western Land Sea New Corridor and support the orderly advancement of RMB internationalization. We'll also promote digital transformation and reform and stimulate the vitality of scientific and technological innovation. Time to delve deeper into this topic, and for that, we are now joined by Xu Qi, Associate Professor of the School of Economics at Zhejiang University. Mr. Xu, great to have you on the show. So let's start with the topic of financing and refinancing. They are critical for many private businesses. What kind of support do they want from financial institutions? Thank you for having me here. Um, I think the private issue facing private business is uh, difficult to access to external funding. Therefore, financial institutions are providing bank loans. And the issue is that the cost of capital is high and the unwillingness to um, increase the uh, credit supply. Therefore, the People's Bank of China has made several efforts towards reducing the cost of capital and uh, motivating financial institutions to increase um, the credit supplies. And secondly, uh, financial institutions also contribute to offering alternative ways for financing, such as um, uh, issuing corporate bonds and issuing uh, equity shares. 
And certainly, financial institution also contribute by uh, for risk management purpose. Thank you. And also, uh, what other financial policies do you think that can be helpful to address the current challenges faced by private businesses? Right. So I think that firstly, the monetary policy will continue to play important roles. So uh, PBOC has introduced several structural policy instruments and continue reducing the cost of capital and increasing funding liquidity. And also the emphasis is very important for the policy coordination and the cooperation across different departments and to facilitate um, the, and encourage um, uh, financial institution to increase the credit supply. And the second issue I think is um, the digitalization will play a very important role. So one issue facing financial institution is a difficulty to assess the credibility and ability to repay the borrowings uh, by the firms. Therefore, um, using the modern financial technology and big data technology can effectively reduce this kind of information asymmetry issue and hence reduce the subsequent credit risk. And um, the recent release of the banking sector uh, inclusive finance digitalization standard will continue promoting the digitalization but under a more regulated framework and has to further improve the, um, the, the, the digitalization. China actually has, uh, in recent months, rolled out a slew of measures to support the private economy. Uh, when and how can we start to assess the effectiveness of these policies? Right. So before the uh, implementation of the policy, several experiments are conducted, such as uh, simulation and the scenario analysis, to check whether the policy is effective and robustness. So for some policies, um, pilot study conducted within a particular region, and if it works, then it will spread across the country. And after the policy uh, implementation, then it's important to timely monitoring the policy objective. In this case, uh, especially the cost of capital and credit supply, whether they are, uh, are moving in the way uh, consistent with the expectation, whether cost of supply cost of capital indeed reduced and the credit supply indeed increased. And it's also very important to ensure the consistent uh, and stable policy, which will help to reduce uncertainty. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was Mr. Xu Qi, Associate Professor of the School of Economics at Zhejiang University for us. As Chinese policymakers continue to improve the supportive financial services for the real economy, the financial sector has become more effective in serving innovation-oriented firms. Our reporter Zhang Shixuan checks out the credit loan demand and supply in high-tech industries. These are aluminum fibers, a material that remains resilient at temperatures higher than 1,200 degrees. And that is crucial for a variety of modern high-tech manufacturing needs. New energy vehicles, aircraft, spaceflight, petrochemical and steel production. The demand has been increasing. There have been a flood of downstream clients reaching out to us. Some applications were figured out by our downstream clients. Since the application scenarios are so varied, the demand exceeds supply. The company's first phase factory was completed last year and is now capable of producing 600 tons of alumina short fibers a year. With the second phase under construction, the plant is costing 3.8 billion yuan and would hardly have been possible without support from the banks. Last year, it took only a month for its loan approval to be issued by the Agriculture Bank of China. Ordinary loans need approval from the bank's head office based on its criteria for examination and approval. But for science innovation companies, the barriers are lower. Many of them can be approved at our primary sub-branch, and the scale and conditions for their loans are usually more relaxed. Chen says that so far this year, the department has issued 9.8 billion yuan worth of loans to science and innovation companies. The Agricultural Bank of China's Shanghai branch has opened a financial service center for science and innovation companies to provide more targeted services. The science and innovation companies that our department mainly serves are in new materials manufacturing, medical equipment, brushed metal and related product manufacturing. Due to recent policy support and market demands, these companies now have higher financing demands. So in addition to traditional project loans for them, we also offer a basket of financial services, including payroll credit for migrant workers. Data from the People's Bank of China shows that loans to technology-based firms saw rapid expansion in the first half of the year in China. 
Middle and long-term outstanding loans to businesses in the high-tech manufacturing industries stood at 2.5 billion yuan, up more than 40 percent from a year ago. Outstanding loans to small and medium-sized enterprises working on science and technology projects reached almost 2.4 trillion yuan, up more than a quarter from a year earlier. Zhang Shuxuan, ICS for CGTN, Shanghai. Time to check out what else is making headlines across China. China has announced the extension of multiple tariff break policies. Partial tariff-free policies were offered to imported goods exhibited at the Shanghai China International Fair for Trading Services, as well as unsold exports of goods that re-entered the country. In the meantime, the accumulative worth of social logistics operations in China was nearly 190 trillion yuan, or over 26 trillion US dollars, in the January to July period, and that is according to the China Federation of Logistics and Purchasing. The figure represents a year-on-year -year increase of 4.7%. The southern city of Guangzhou has announced the easing of mortgage curbs, making it the first major city in the country to do so. And this comes as the government hopes to stimulate market demand and give a boost to the real estate sector. China's domestic mobile companies have faced serious challenges in recent years caused by increasing tensions with the United States. But the difficulties have unleashed a wave of manufacturing and innovation in the country. As Chinese chip manufacturers find their feet, the industry is pushing ahead. Dai Kai reports. Due to sanctions led by the United States, China's domestic mobile companies have faced significant challenges in the 5G chip sector. This has had a direct impact on smart devices produced within the country, limiting their ability to access 5G capabilities. But things are changing. In response to the challenge, Chinese chip manufacturers are taking proactive steps to address the issue and drive the industry towards mass production. Notably, China Mobile, a prominent telecom service provider, introduced a new 5G chip at its collaborative development conference that experts believe has considerable potential in a wide range of commercial applications. This is the first domestically made chip in China that can be used for various types of 5G based stations, like cloud based, compact, and home based stations. It's like a translator between radio waves and digital signals, just like the senses in our body, converting sound and light into signals our brain understands. As a vital element in 5G compatible equipment, developing the chip has been a challenge, but there is significant demand from diverse industries. The team working on it tailored the chip so that it's both cost effective and energy efficient, making it accessible to a wider range of users. Through the collaboration between operators' applications and research and the joint efforts of chip companies and device manufacturers, I believe we'll see more and more key chips coming out that address critical gaps. This model will drive development, serving the construction of our country's network in the long run. This new tech breakthrough shows that Chinese companies are reshaping the 5G chips landscape. Due to global geopolitical tensions, Chinese companies have been severely constrained with technologies like this. But Chinese enterprises are working hard to find solutions. They're depending on their own research and development to address a gap in the domestic market, further strengthening the nation's 5G network infrastructure. Like I CGTN, Beijing. You're watching Global Business on CGTN. Still to come on the program, Britain's top diplomat James Cleverly visits China today. And this is the first trip by a UK foreign secretary to China in over five years. We get behind the trade and economic ties between the two countries. The world economy as we know it is about to change. Global Business Reports highlight emerging markets, developing countries, and dynamic sectors worldwide. We feature top analysts and newsmakers to provide perspectives on every facet of business. From an on-the-ground perspective, we provide you with balanced and objective assessments. Fast, sharp, and insightful. Global Business. Only on CGTN.
Welcome back. Chinese Vice President Han Zhen met with UK Foreign Secretary James Cleverly in Beijing on Wednesday. Han emphasized the importance of mutual respect and women cooperation between China and the UK. He urged the two countries to maintain communication in international and regional affairs for world peace and development. He said strong partnership is crucial for the steady advancement of China-UK relations. He added that it is important for governments to foster favorable business conditions and create new opportunities for growth. Cleverly praised China's global influence and its contributions to the world economy and poverty reduction. He said the two sides should continue to strengthen high-level exchanges and explore new areas for practical cooperation. Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi also met with Cleverly for talks on Wednesday. Cleverly is the highest-ranking British official to visit China in five years since former UK Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt's visit in 2018. China-UK cooperation has generated significant developmental prospects for both sides. In 2022, China became Britain's third largest trading partner, with bilateral trade reaching 689 billion yuan. That's equivalent to 96 billion US dollars, which is a remarkable year-on-year -year surge of 20.5 percent. And among the UK's top three trading partners, China accounted for 9.3 percent of trade last year. And simultaneously, a growing number of British enterprises are identified opportunities within China. According to a report published by the British Chamber of Commerce in China, 86% of the surveyed British companies hold a positive outlook on the long-term potential of the Chinese market. During the first seven months of this year, foreign direct investment from the UK into Chinese mainland in actual use rose 160% on a yearly basis. And for more insights on the cooperation between China and the UK, let's bring in Peter Doran, a senior lecturer at the School of Law, Queen's University, Belfast, the UK. Mr. Doran, great to have you on the show. Uh, let's start with uh, expectations. What do you think we can expect out of Cleverly's visit in terms of expanding economic cooperation? Well, uh, Mr. Cleverly um, has described his mission as uh, an attempt to reset relationships between the UK and China. Uh, this is a new pragmatism, if you like. He's under pressure from certain sections of the Conservative Party who would have been behind a more um, hostile uh, orientation to China. People like Ian Duncan Smith, who is uh, subject to um, sanctions, actually, as a, a former leader of the Conservative Party over concerns about the, the treatment of the Uyghur community. But this is a, a new regime under Rishi Sunak. Um, on the shopping list, I'd say there are issues like uh, improved collaboration on investment in the uh, in battery technology uh, for vehicles, for example. Um, there are interests in expanding uh, collaboration in the financial sector. Uh, there's a Counts now for about 0.6 of the uh, UK's uh, financial um, activity. And uh, as your correspondent has indicated, this pragmatism comes on the back of uh, a growth, a significant growth, at the, as registered at the, uh, the, the, the first quarter of this year, a significant growth of about 11% in overall trade. Um, it's not something that the UK can uh, risk. And I think they'll be hoping to, to grow that uh, financial cooperation. And also China and UK's uh, bilateral trade volume reached actually a new record high in year 2022. So going forward, uh, what will be the main driver in this economic relationship? There's, uh, there are, of course, uh, uh, tensions within the Conservative Party over this uh, move by Cleverly and Rishi Sunak. Uh, but as I've said, the economic uh, figures are much too important for the UK to dismiss or even risk. Um, nevertheless, there, there are qualifications. They have continuing concerns about Hong Kong, democracy, and as I've said, uh, issues around the campaigning by some MPs in the Conservative Party around the treatment of the Uyghur community. Having said that, um, there is uh, an interest in uh, further collaboration 
on areas like climate change, which is becoming part of the security consideration, the security complex, if you like, and the uh, investment and collaboration in areas like new technologies, uh, battery technology, and even uh, artificial intelligence, these are areas that they want to collaborate on because it also meets uh, a multilateral commitment by both countries to, to lead in the response to the transition in the wake of uh, global climate change. Yes, uh, speaking of which, we know that both countries have set up uh, carbon neutral goals. How do you view the potential for cooperation in clean energy and green development? Yes, um, in the wake of uh, Brexit, with uh, uh, inflation problems, with issues around energy uh, in the UK arising from the geopolitical destabilization of the Ukraine war. Um, the UK is uh, um, attempting really to, to put up the sign that uh, it's open for business, it's open for new trade opportunities. And they want to do this in ways that uh, meet their multilateral profile around leading the uh, approaches, the responses to climate change. Uh, Mr. Cleverly has also indicated that he will be raising issues about uh, biodiversity and responses to the collapse of biodiversity. So these are issues that are beginning to, as I say, um, become part of the, the, the security uh, with the, the security conversation, um, and the, I think the uh, the Premier Li Jiang put his finger on the issues for both the US and the UK that countries can no longer risk over politicising these issues. Um, it's one thing to pursue a national resource uh, uh, competition and to be competing on. Uh, in terms of the microchip technology and, and rare metals. But these have wider global implications. They can, have, uh, they can stall uh, these countries' uh, responses to um, issues that won't go away and issues that are extremely urgent, including the, uh, the, the climate crisis. Well, great insight. Thank you very much, Mr. Peter Doran, Senior Lecturer at the School of Law, Queen's University, Belfast, the UK. The U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo is in Shanghai currently wrapping up her four-day visit. At a press conference, Raimondo talked up American firms' desire to do business in China. She said there was strong appetite among U.S. businesses to make the relationship better. And during her visit, Raimondo met with Chinese Premier Li Qiang, where he, she reiterated that the U.S. has no intention to contain China and is not seeking to decouple. She conveyed that the U.S. hopes to continue talks in cooperation with China, particularly in AI, climate change, and family-related issues. Remodel that is the fourth key Biden administration of official to visit China this year, arrived in Beijing on Sunday as the U.S. seek to boost bilateral business ties. Chen Tuyin reports. Productive, candid, open, and constructive. Uh, these are the words that uh, Raimondo used when describing her four-day visit to China. Uh, first of all, during the presser, she spoke highly of what has been achieved during uh, over the past three days, uh, through not only through the talks with Chinese uh, government officials, but also through the visits to some iconic U.S. enterprises like uh, Disneyland, uh, like uh, Boeing. Uh, she also reiterated that the United States has no intention of holding China's economy back while acknowledging challenges and disagreements remain. Uh, Raimondo admitted that these won't be solved after a few days of talks, but also said that she's leaving the country with optimism. It's Especially as new communication channels have been established and the two sides uh, have decided to exchange information on U.S. export controls and establish a China-U.S. working group to discuss some commercial issues, which Raimondo believes will increase clarity and transparency uh, or more action and hopefully result in a stable commercial relationship that benefits both uh, countries. And uh, during the press, I attempted to raise questions uh, like, uh, you know, the U.S. The, Raimondo repeatedly said that they had, the U.S. had no intention to hinder China's econ economy, but uh, what about the entity list? 
but unfortunately, um, they refused the question. But hopefully, we can get the positive answer in the near future. In the meantime, New York City has held its first outdoor Chinese food and culture festival, a real feast for local foodies. Karina Michelle takes a look. New York City is home to several vibrant Chinatown communities that started to flourish in the late 19th century, according to government data. Given that fact, it's all the more surprising that Dragon Fest is the city's first official festival celebrating Chinese food and culture. That's a lot to live up to. So come with me and let's take a look at what's on offer. So Raymond, tell me what we have so from here. The first here. thing is the Nefai Club Bombs. Um, it's, uh, it's the crispy bottom uh, bombs. So the second one is the one that's spicy peanut sauce. Sparse tofu is the braised, uh, like the, the wheat gluten, and also with the mushrooms. And this is the noodle with scallion sauce. It looked really tightly. A little bit, just a little bit, yeah. Well, that's my favorite. That's okay. so good. Yeah. This is our traditional uh, 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 hair accessory. Uh, we call the ronghua and the tanghua. Uh, that's 100% handmade, and all of that made by silk. Few attendees we spoke to enjoyed the food and the scene. Do you mind showing us what you got? Uh, it's like a pork bun. It's pretty good. Why Which, did you decide to come to the food festival today? We actually saw it on social media, just wanted to, um, you know, try and, and, and just try different food. And so how do you like it? So far, it's pretty good. The festival is the brainchild of entrepreneur Biu Biu Xu. Originally from eastern China, the now New York resident said she had a clear vision when she came up with the idea for Dragon Fest. I live here for eight years and there's so many other like countries seeing street fair like Japan Fest, like Philippine Fest, but no one do any, you know, Chinese uh, street fair before. And I'm from China, so that's the reason I really want to help our country to do some our um, culture seeing the street fair in New York City. She says more than 100 vendors are taking part in the inaugural festival, adding the turnout this past weekend was overwhelming. It's really a surprise because first events, we already have 35,000 traffic, and yesterday we have 50,000 traffic. One attendee said he wasn't surprised at all. Food always brings people together. Yeah, especially in China, like we have a sharing food culture. We want to share our love to the world as well. Local restaurant manager Raymond Lee shared he's grateful for the enthusiastic response and hopes it helps further revive business after the pandemic. It's so busy, so many people came, and we are so lucky. And we feel so happy. Xu told us she hopes to expand future Dragon Fest to other cities with large Chinese immigrant populations, including Boston and Los Angeles, and incorporate more art and live performances. If you're interested in experiencing some of the tantalizing cuisine and culture on offer, Dragon Fest has one more final festival being held during the final weekend in September. Karina Mitchell, CGTN, New York. And that'll do for this edition of Global Business here on CGTN. Thanks for being with us. I'm Lilulu in Beijing. Till next time, bye for now.